Our speaker for today is uh, uh, a new member of our department, Dr. Mark Merrick. He, uh, he cannot be here today, therefore he will give his talk from, uh, from the West Coast. Okay. From his uh, current place, okay. As you can see, the title of Dr. Uh, of Mark's uh, talk is Fast Development Stack for Mechanisms Mechanized the Software Construction. Okay. And in, in, in this talk, he will uh, he will present uh, an overview of the thinking that drives uh, the development of this uh, this special uh, software construction stack. Okay. Uh, well, welcome, Dr. Uh, Mark. Us talk, and uh, at the end we will have a ten minutes Q and A session. Okay. So let's welcome Dr. Hey, Mark. Okay. Well, great. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, and thanks everybody for joining me. Um, yes, I'm currently on the West Coast. It is. Uh, into the rainy season here, so very gloomy. I saw it look like nicer weather today uh, there in Lexington. So thanks for coming inside and, and missing out on that to hear my talk. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be joining the department. I should be there in January. So I'm looking forward to meeting uh, everybody in person a little more, but uh, virtual will have to do for now. So let me start off with just a little bit of background um, about myself here. Uh, oops, sorry. Be closer to your uh, your speaker or your mic. Um, let me just double check my audio then. You were fading in and out. We I don't was... know for under hours. Okay, let me see. Sounds good now, though, right? Yeah. Now you're fine. Now I'm fine. Okay. Um, sure, I can be just a touch closer. Let me check one thing real quick. Hmm, microphone. Okay, sure. I will just stay a little closer. Please let me know if the audio, uh, goes out again. So uh, yeah, let me start off with a little bit of background about myself. Um, so I've, I've done some work in program analysis and verification. I, I started my PhD um, doing aliasing points to analysis. So do two references point to the same thing is a, a set of objects on the heap, like a tree or a cycle. Um, both empirical studies, runtime analysis, and static analysis tools here. Uh, I dabbled in SMT modulo theory-based verification. This was very popular in the 2010 timeframe. So use a theorem prover to show that uh, some small bit of code doesn't say do out of access, uh, uh, bounds accesses, or null pointer dereferences. Prove that two small loops do the same type of thing. Um, and after that, I got a little bit into sort of what's called program synthesis. So maybe take a, a reference loop in C, search the space of all possible programs using SIMD operations like SSE2 or SSE4, uh, see if you can find an optimized version that you can prove does the same thing as your simple reference implementation. Uh, move from there a little bit uh, when I joined Microsoft Research doing what's sort of called uh, you know, programming by natural language or, or uh, programming by example. So someone would say something like, I have an Excel spreadsheet and I want to sum all the items in the table with a sale code. Uh, and you would sort of generate the appropriate Excel formula to do this program for somebody who doesn't necessarily know how to program, but wants to do something um, algorithmic. And then also a little later on, kind of interestingly, I, I worked with the co-pilot team on training and bias in the training data for the first version of uh, co-pilot that was released. So that was kind of fun to come back to natural language 
processing, but from a very different approach using deep learning rather than this sort of uh, synthesis. I've also done some work in diagnostics, run times, build systems. So I spent a couple of years with the Chakra JavaScript engine team building a time travel debugger for Node.js. Um, when they did a little pivot and started becoming a fork of Chromium, uh, did some work with them on this problem of we have thousands of developers and huge amounts of changes coming from the upstream Chromium open source project. We have huge amounts of changes coming from our internal Microsoft developers. How do we automate the process of merging these streams of changes together and resolving all the conflicts that can happen? And then I've done some work with garbage collection and, and other kinds of stuff. So the, the interesting thing for me is looking back on this, like what is all this sort of boil down to, and it's really the same set of challenges and problems I wanna solve. It's, well, how do we make it easier to build software quickly, efficiently, cost-effectively? How do we increase the quality of the software that is produced? And how do we make it possible for more people to benefit from the ability to automate repetitive tasks with computers and software, right? And so it's sort of, we wanna automate and mechanize this process as much as possible, you know, with, again, like I said, objectives. I want to increase the speed at which a feature can be rolled out, decrease the number of engineers that are required. Um, I want to eliminate entire categories of bugs, reduce risk if you're a large company that's exposed from bugs or so, um, uh, security issues, right? And I want to enable more people to build software with confidence and not have to depend on just a small set of developers or an IT department. They can take charge of what they want to do and build it themselves. Now, the interesting thing to me is, is a couple of years ago when I started to sit back and look at all of these things I was trying to do is I felt like I was kind of going back and doing the same thing over and over again. And really what it boiled down to is there would be a specific problem I would want to tackle how to build and you know, optimize a loop. And the first step would be look at this code and build a static analysis that would go through and understand what the original loop was doing. And that was kind of the, the core thing. Or if there was um, you know, bugs that we wanted to fix, it would be take a look at these common categories of bugs that humans had and understand why they would be confused when reading a piece of source code or why they would be confused about writing a piece of source code. And so it really came down to the, the key problem was understanding a bit of software. And as I mentioned, sometimes this understanding was I need to build a static analysis tool that's going to understand this software. And there are a set of common things that make this hard. You know, For people who have done static analysis or abstract interpretation, Loops, inductive invariance, and widening. Mutable state, aliasing. These are just core problems that have been in the community for decades and decades and decades and are still open and very unsolved problems. So kind of always, always a challenge you face and, and very difficult to overcome. Humans, you know, when we go back and look at the sources of bugs that really bite people, they come from a lot of kind of common software idioms that pop up, non-deterministic behavior, surprising behavior that, you know, intuition tells you the software works one way, but, you know, that, that thing you knew or thought you knew turns out to be wrong and leads you in a very bad path. So, you know, a classic example of this is log4j, right? I'm just writing a log message. Why would it go and download some software from the web compile it into a, a Java a jar, and then actually execute that untrusted code, right? You, you know, you wouldn't expect that, but it's it's right there in the code. It's been there for a huge amount of time, but, you know, you were just misled by your intuition about what it should do versus what it really did. And coming into this world, we also have AI agents that are now trying to reason about code just the way humans do or, or, or these automated tools do. And the question is, how are they gonna fit into this mix how are they going to be able to reason about programming languages? Do they um, have attributes that make them particularly capable or provide or, or particular challenges when they look at how to reason about code? So, um, you know, one thing is current like large language models are very textual. They don't have an understanding of the semantics of the code in any pre-trained way. They just see a stream of tokens 
and likelihood of predictions of the next token. Now, they may have learned some kind of model of semantics in the code. For instance, if I see a if x is not equal to null, the next token is more likely to be a dereference of x than some check that it's null again. But it doesn't have like, a, you know, it didn't read the semantics definition of the code and know how to apply that. So in this model, how do we make sure that we can expose some of this semantic information in a way that the tool actually has access to, right? So um, I guess sort of the takeaway is, you know, reasoning is hard, whether you're a uh, symbolic agent, whether you're a human, or whether you're an AI agent. And there are some, uh, you know, varieties in the reasons that make this reasoning hard, but there are a lot of common issues, right? And this inability to reason about code slows developers down. It increases the, the possibility of introducing errors and, and bugs in the code. And, um, you know, it makes it difficult for non-expert users to adopt uh, these technologies, because if I can't reason about a piece of code and guarantee that it's safe, like it's not going to delete someone's data or expose their personal identif identifying information, you know, publicly somehow just uploading it to a public S3 bucket, right? It's difficult for me to say, hey, use these tools. You can be confident they're not going to be harmful, right? So what's the vision that we have? Well, it's how do we build a software stack, right? And this is more than just a programming language. The programming language is the, the core basis, but we wanna build tools and workflows and experiences, um, this whole stack that are optimized for humans, automated tools, AI agents, and users to interact in creating and understanding software. So oftentimes when people give talks about, you know, a programming language problem or a program analysis problem, um, they're going to come and say, well, we have some great new language construct that is a better abstraction, or we have a fancy new analysis. And the, the, the vision I'm, I'm taking in, in this work is not um, that we need something new, but the problem is actually that we have too much complexity in these languages, that there are too many things going on. And that makes it difficult to understand. So the solution is not adding more complexity. The solution is actually to take this away and design you know, the language with some care and mindfulness and add the expressive power that we need, but be careful about adding all these incidental bits of complexity that seem nice or convenient, but just lead to problems in the end from all this experience we have. So, the first thing that, that comes out of this is we want to build an intermediate representation that's well suited towards reasoning for anybody. And it's a very core, simple, compact um, uh, structure. So we're going to try and eliminate some of these foundational sources of complexity that I mentioned earlier. So it has no loops, right? It's sort of the classic functional, uh, all values are immutable and referentially transparent. So you, that means you can swap pointers by ref to by value, and there's no semantically observable way to tell this from the source code. And we want to fully determinize the semantics. So that is, there is exactly one possible valid output for any piece of code. So there's no more questions of, does the iteration order of a hash table change at some point in time? Or you know, is the sort stable or unstable? Or, you know, can this value be undefined and you get some random uh, uh, output from it? There's always one unique thing. So this really simplifies reasoning in a surprising, surprising way. The other thing we want to do is, you know, this goes back to large language models and them only seeing explicit textual information. Um, humans have the same, same challenge, like this log for J. There was implicit information about this call downloading and executing code that was not explicit in the signature for using it. So how do we lift some of these important details into the, the textual rep representation of the code so they're not easy to miss by assumptions? And you know, there's some common ways, well-known ways to do this, like adding asserts and data invariants. Um, and then also increasing sort of the ability to add typing annotations to things that were previously opaque. And we'll see a minute of uh, an example of that in a minute. Now, the next challenge is uh, you could imagine you can build an IR that's very optimized towards reasoning, but the language is so 
full of details and so laborious to type and so exhausting to work with that, you know, no one would ever want to write code in it, right? Or no mere mortal developer would want to write code in it. So the next challenge is how do we build a, a surface syntax for this language that matches well with a human aesthetic and developer intuition? So we would like this really to be uh, approachable by a dev coming from, let's say, a TypeScript or a C Sharp background. They, they may not have, you know, understand anything about theorem provers or formal methods. They just know how to write Java. And we want them to be able to look at this language at a glance, say, ah, these concepts make sense to me. Uh, I can be productive within a few days and I never need to know about all this formal, you know, cleverness that got baked in there. So we're going to basically do some clever compiler and language design stuff to allow block structures with variable reassignments. So it looks kind of like you have a little bit of mutability and you can do easy control flow manipulation, but we map it back to this very nice, pure and immutable representation, right? Uh, we wanna have inheritance and all these nice things, but we don't wanna have all of the difficulty of building complex object graphs with uh, subtle mutability baked in. So we'll show how to do that in a sec. So let me um, pivot back and ground this a little bit, and I can show a couple of, of concrete examples. So the first one is uh, absolute value here. And um, just like I was mentioning, it has a variable sign that we initially set to the value or integer one. And then we have a, you know, an if condition where we reassign that local variable to negative one, and then we go and we do the multiplication on it. So this looks like a nice block structured language. Actually, this is um, aside from the annotation on the on the numeric constant to indicate that it's an integer, this is valid TypeScript, right? So this is very approachable for most developers. We have another example here. I want to, you know, rather than have a loop that goes from i equals zero to list our args dot length, you know, test something and return true if it's there. We have a rich library of these functors. So you can do computation with these uh, operators. So all of, it just tests if the predicate is true for all of the elements, right? And so this um, actually takes care of most of the uses that you would want uh, to use a loop for and has the nice properties that it's easier to analyze, but also for human developers, they don't have to look at a loop and look at the iteration structure and look at the body and kind of reverse engineer what the intent is. The intent is explicit just in the name of the operator. So this is kind of a, a nice win-win-win. It's easier for a static analysis. It's easier for humans. And it's also easier for an LLM. Like it has the same textual view. It knows all of. It has the semantic meaning of what that, that is. And it doesn't have to reverse engineer the loop either. Um, we also go and we want to have this explicit intent. We want to make it easy for a developer uh, to express not only some source code, but what that source code should do or what some uh, constraints on it should be. So, you know, here we have like this GCD function. We have explicit and standard way to put in a requires. So if you call this function, X should always be greater than zero. Y should always be greater than zero. And then um, the return value should always be greater than zero. But you might want to also control these, right? You might have some tests or some checks that you want to run all the time, some that are only in tests, some that are only in debugs, so you can kind of control this. Uh, interestingly, in working with some uh, developers at very large scale, we also have a version of this that is, um, you know, always basically, you know, you might be able to prove that in no case this algorithm ever returns something that is less than zero, right? That is, you know, this is impossible semantically based on, on the code and there's no way this could ever happen. And yet you go and deploy this in production and someone has a cosmic ray come in and flip a bit in their RAM and change the value randomly. So that, that value is there. And in fact, this test would fail. And so <laughs> they, there there's, uh, was a definite interest in, we wanna have tests that even though in theory they could never happen, in practice, because of the world we live in and the scale that we're at and hardware errors, it's a safety concern. We don't want to actually corrupt data before we store it on disk. We want to do this check always, always, always. And we had to go fight the compiler to make sure it didn't optimize these checks out. So Bosky actually supports the ability to put a safety annotation that is on there that says, this check should always be run 
like never, never eliminated. So this is, you know, sort of a very funny story um, that you don't think of until you see these kinds of things at scale. Um, another example of this explicit intent is uh, uh, data invariants, which are actually very, very useful for finding bugs and, and very intuitive for describing to other developers what a data object should be and how it should work. So the example we have here is a, a calendar event and you can see it has like a name and a location and a start time and a duration. But we can also then put these invariants on there. Like the name and location should never be empty, right? They should have some content. The duration should always be greater than uh, you know zero. There shouldn't be empty events on your calendar. And so these things are a nice way to make sure that accidental bugs don't creep through. But also if I'm a consumer of this um, type, I immediately have a bunch of information about what values can be and can't be and what assumptions are safe for me to make. Rather than having to sort of infer it from maybe a comment or my understanding of the code or what one of my colleagues said that might be outdated and leads me to make a mistake. So this is a very concrete um, and explicit way for this information to be conveyed that stays in sync with the actual implementation. So another example of making things explicit is uh, a feature we introduced called, we call type strings. And this comes up a lot, particularly as people have moved to this uh, cloud-based polyglot development environment, where the least common denominator for passing data around is strings, right? And numbers, that's kind of all you have, and, um, you know, a, arrays of bytes that go over the network. And then it, in these worlds, it becomes very easy to have an API that is, you know, foo takes string, string, string. And the only way to get any meaningful information on these is to look at the, 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 the document uh, co comments and make sure that you don't accidentally swap two arguments, kind of make some assumptions about what content could be in a string. And we wanted to eliminate this. So what this allows us to do is give a regular expression. So we'll do a type tackle zip code of US. And so it's this standard five digit plus a four digit extension. And then you can say, I have a string of something that conforms to this particular regular expression. And this is now a type in the type system. So I could have, for example, is New York code, I can pass it, you know, this one zero 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 one zip code. And that, that is a valid, uh, string that matches that regex format and this function will treat it like a extract the string value, do some tests, return true. It's great. Um, you don't have to do any fancy type construction, destruction, conversion, parsing, anything beyond just this annotation. So it's very lightweight to add, but you get all the values of type checking. So if I try to just pass it the string 12, well, the type checker will actually say, no, this is not a valid string of zip code US, this is a type error, right? Or perhaps I had a postcode UK. If I constructed one of these, that's gonna be distinct from a US zip code. So it'll allow me to do type checking and um, get all these nice errors, but it also gives an immediate explicit explanation about what a string actually is gonna contain and what it means in a way that's easy for a human or an AI model to pick up and understand what the intent is. Uh, we also have support for type numbers. Uh, you may be familiar with these, like other languages have new type constructors. So I could basically say, I want a type called Fahrenheit that is an int, and this type Fahrenheit is gonna be distinct from all other new types that have been created for ints. So I can do type checking, miles per hour and that. One of the nice things is in Bosky, um, you you can do these you know assignments and, and um, constant constructors, but we also allow you to assign invariants on top of these. So in many cases, like my percentage, it's gonna be a nat, but I also wanna assert that it's always less than 100. So I can add an extra semantic bit of information to it, which I can then check statically. So if you try and create a 101 percentage, we can check that statically that that's an error. And if you do some addition, like I have A, um, you know, plus 25% when A was already 100%, well, that'll be a runtime error and we'll actually catch that as well. And we'll, we'll show later, we can actually do some static checking to see, uh, detect these two. So this makes this a really powerful way to easily decorate a lot of primitive data types with additional semantic information, both 
that is useful for understanding what they are, but then provides really concrete um, definitions that we can check at runtime and statically later. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier for developers to use these APIs safely in the first place and easier for us to then go and check them and, and catch any bugs that may have slipped through. So an example of this, uh, one of the first tools we built with Bosky, and the, the goal here was we said, well, we want a language that's good at automated reasoning. And one of the most challenging things you can do in the automated reasoning framework is say, given a assertion, either from the language definition or the user defined assertion, I want to go and I want to generate a proof that that particular assertion can never be triggered, or I want to generate a witness, like a model, a set of inputs that would you could put into the, the uh, concrete runtime in your debugger and see that error trigger and then go debug it, right? So this is kind of one of the, the most canonical problems out there. And if we can show that we can reason well in this very comprehensive setting, then it was a good demonstration that we could also reason well and in simpler abstract interpretation or data flow type analysis. We, um, it's kind of interesting when I talked with developers, uh, I had a great chance when I was working with the Chakra JavaScript team to go to a lot of developer conferences and, and talk with developers at big companies, small companies, all in between. And one of the things that I really asked about was you, you have a ton of bugs, you know, in your software and, and you don't like that, right? Like nobody likes having customer complaints and unhappy customers. And, you know, wouldn't it be great if you had a tool that could go and if you had a spec for your code, check that there were no bugs relative to this spec. And, you know, with, I think without exception, people said, yes, I would love that. But the question is how much, how much additional developer effort would I need to write that spec? And if I don't have a proof that my program satisfies that spec, how would I, you know, get an engineer who knows how these theorem provers work and, and solve this? And, you know, really, if I want to improve the quality of my software, I have an issue tracker that's full of bugs. I can just grab three devs and say, for a week, we're going to do a bug bash, and that's going to improve the quality of my software. So I'd really like formal methods to be applied to my software to keep these bugs from creeping in in the first place, but I want them to come in a way where I don't have to understand this, this proof and in a way that maps back well to my current workflow of give me a small reproduction of a bug and I can fix it and understand it quickly. So we took a slight variation on this classic, um, you know, program verifier approach and said, we're gonna tweak it and we're gonna prove that there's no small model that triggers that bug. So given any assertion, I wanna look at your program and I wanna either prove that there's no, and I'll define this in a, sec in a second, simple input that'll trigger that bug or I want to be able to generate that simple input that'll trigger that bug for you. So it's easy for you to go and, and fix it. <clears throat> so when I say small, basically we say input collections have five elements or less and recursive data structures are at most three levels deep. And as I said, our, our discussions from real developers, uh, but also interesting empirical studies on bug databases and, and other software show that most bugs that you're interested in or most bugs actually have this property. You can certainly find some cases where it doesn't hold, but uh, you know, at least for sort of the 90% uh, value, this is, this is a good place to start. <clears throat> so for those of you that aren't familiar with SAT modulo theory solvers, they're a very interesting uh, construct where at the, at the base you have a SAT solver and it's just going to do Boolean SAT solving, but they're enriched with a set of theories. And they basically say, um, you know, I can reason about integers uh, and linear arithmetic, or I can reason about constructors uh, or sequences. And what they'll do is they'll basically uh, sort of do a communication setup where if I have a problem that says I need X is less than Y and A equals B, it'll first pick Boolean assignments for X is less than Y and A is equal to B. And it'll say, oh, you know, X is less than Y needs to be true. A equals B needs to be false. And then it'll go off to these theory solvers and say, given all the other things you know about the world, is X less than Y? And it, if the theory solver says, yeah, that works with me, 
then this will be a satisfying assignment and it'll generate a model for all these theories. If there's a conflict, it'll go back to the SAT solver and say, oh, X less than Y actually needs to be true. Let me flip that and then iterate back with the theory solvers. So it's a very clever kind of construct that allows you to take you know, primitive solvers for each of these theories and a very powerful SAT solver and use them to reason about you know, almost you know, a very complex software objects with nats and ints and real numbers and algebra and data types and sequences and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so we do a very simple mapping by construction. All of the data types in Bosky, like nats and ints, go to the theory of ints. Floats and decimals go to the theory of real. Strings go to the theory of strings. Um, everything's very straightforward. And using the small input restriction to control the length of sequences, uh, this actually means that this fragment is decidable. Uh, so what that means is that if there exists a small model, we in theory will always be able to generate it. In practice, SAT is NP complete, so we might time out, but you know, in theory at least we can always solve it. And this set of theories, you know, we picked carefully in consultation with the actual developers of Z3 to make sure that these theories not only are theoretically decidable, but very efficiently decidable in Z3. So we're actually fast in practice as well as in theory. So let me show you an example here. We'll start off with the uh, absolute value function that I, I showed earlier. And the SMT lib version of this, which is uh, a way to communicate uh, logical formula with, th with theories to Z3, actually is almost isomorphic to it. You can see that the you know types have gone across. You can see um, interestingly where sign the va variable sign used to be assigned multiple values. This is a compiler trick we used converting this um, reassignment into what's called dynamic single assignment form, or you know a related one is single static assignment form that you may have heard. So we convert the reassignments to assignments to distinct variables with um, uh, appropriate flow path manipulation to, to capture the sort of uh, semantic effect of the original reassignment. So this allows us to do some syntactic rewriting to turn what looks like reassignment into uh, just assignment to multiple different variables, which is kind of kind of cute. So let's see how this works. Um, so I have a tic-tac-toe program here. I'll start this running has a lot of code, you see that we have a, a method called set cell mark that requires that the cell you want to set is empty. And now over here, we have a, a test file that has some classic unit tests, but it also has some tests that are parametric. So it takes a board position that is undefined as a parameter. And what the solver will do is it will go and try and find a value for this board position that will cause that test to fail. And you can see some of them were able to prove that there's no input that would cause that test to fail. And in the failing test one, which we expected to fail, it was able to you know, find that failure was possible and build an input that would actually cause that crash, right? That you can go and debug. So if we set um, the position at column zero, row one, which already had an element in there because we didn't check for that beforehand, it'll cause the failure. And as you can see, um, you know, this runs in less than half a second for each of these inputs. So this is actually pretty, pretty efficient for these types of analysis and it scales very well. Now, as I mentioned, we um, started with this task as it was sort of one of the, the canonical challenging reasoning tasks. And it gave us a building block that once we can do this, we can actually um, apply it to a lot of other problems. So one of those is mocking. Uh, and this is particularly painful when people are developing cloud services. So, you know, you can imagine I'm, let's say I'm building an application that talks to the National Weather Service to get the forecast for tomorrow. I wanna know if I need to bring my umbrella or something. Now, if I want to test my application, my code goes and hits this call that says, call the National Weather Service and get the forecast for my city. So what do I do? Well, I can either just let that call go out to the National Weather Service every time I run my unit tests. But in that case, my tests are non-deterministic. So the output of my test is going to change randomly based on when I run it and what the weather looks like. And so this isn't too good, right? Or even worst case scenario, 
if that callout actually wrote to a database, I don't want my test to be mucking around in production data. Uh, the other one is I can try and create a, let's say, test environment where I stand up all the services that my service needs in some isolated environment, in which case I need to duplicate all of these other services in their entirety, right? Which is a huge amount of engineering effort. Uh, and then the one that most people apply or at least apply a little bit is I'm gonna mock a service. So I'm gonna go and rather than implement that whole service, I will hand write a few examples that are sufficient for my unit tests of for this you know, call, what should I return? Mock is my return. And then I'll, you know, as I add new tests, I might need to change these or I might need to update these. And this tends to be a lot of work. So in practice, there's very little unit testing done on these distributed applications. It's kind of, uh, well, we, we test in production and if our dashboard lights up red, we roll it back real quick, uh, but we hope for the best, right? Um, one other thing I'll mention that's really interesting is when dealing with PII or other sensitive information, oftentimes, uh, a company will not actually want to let the developers even see real data because it, you know, the, the 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 potential for a leak or a breach, right? So it's even more difficult because the developer kind of can't even put in real data or look at real data for these and everything needs to be manually put together. So you spend an incredible amount of time manually constructing data sets just to manage the unit tests you know, and it's almost a, a full-time job in addition to just actually writing the code that provides value. So this is a very um, difficult place. But since I mentioned the solver, it can take a bunch of constraints and it can generate a model of these constraints and convert that back into actual concrete program values, right? So what we can do with this is we can say, suppose I have a function, you know, like like I was talking about for the National Weather Service. Well, I'm going to give you a location, an airport code, and I want you to spit back a temp range. And the only thing that, you know, maybe I guarantee about this temp range is that the min temp is less than the max temp. Well, I can go to Z3 and, you know, when I'm running my unit test, if I hit a call to this uh, with a value, say, Seattle or Phoenix, I can ask Z3 generate me a set of values that satisfy the insurer's clause and are valid. So I'll auto-generate all these mock values rather than asking you to write them by hand. Um, one uh, perhaps advantage or disadvantage of Z3 is that it really doesn't care about what your intent was with this notion of airport code or Phoenix. It just sees I need integers. So it is actually good at generating satisfying values, but values that are maybe a little unexpected. Right, so this is kind of a good way to uh, test maybe some of the assumptions in other parts of your code by giving it a slightly unusual value for the temperature in Phoenix, like you know a high of zero in Phoenix is a little cold. You can also go and augment this with perhaps a call to um, you know GPT-4, and you can say, hey, I have a call to a function called get temp range from Phoenix with a min and a max, what do you think good values are? And it'll actually come back with some very natural, nice looking values. So you have the option, and then you can verify these again with Z3, or um, you can go and actually concrete execute the insurance clause to make sure they satisfy the constraint. So by plugging all this together, you start having the ability to generate a variety of interesting mock values for your application. So not only are we automating the process, but we're improving the quality of the testing uh, framework you get, right? So this is really exciting kind of stuff. Um, so far, I've talked about the ability to reason about code, improving code quality, like verification, testing, all of that. It's also interesting if you can understand and you have more constraints about what code can be doing, you have some interesting opportunities to actually make this code more performant as well. So particularly, the amount of memory you've consumed. Uh, we did a very interesting experiment around computation offloading. Um, so this would be something like, uh, oh my gosh, I've drawn a total blank, EVPF. So this um, function in the Linux kernel where you can write specialized small programs and actually load them into kernel space so that you don't have to trap up 
whenever you want to execute them. And this is initially used for like um, packet processing and network stuff, but you can also use it for, for other things um, to make your application run more efficiently. Now, eBPF is interesting in that it guarantees um, some that this doesn't stomp on kernel memory, which is of course very important, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee other properties like that this, this task ever terminates or how quickly it terminates. So you don't even have soft real-time guarantees. With Bosky, since we have a much more constrained environment, we can actually write much more complex code than the EBF, eBPF verifier could accept. And we can prove that not only is it safe to offload as in it won't stomp on resources it's not allowed to, but we can actually guarantee uh, termination bounds, memory use bounds, and give some soft real-time guarantees, right? Which is a lot of fun. Uh, also did a prototype GC implementation that gives you a lot of very nice features. So it, it does ref counting uh, with some other, um, with a young nursery, right? kind of nice. But some of the language features of Bosky mean that we don't need to have a backup cycle collector. Right? So we never have a 99% latent, tail latency when we really had to then mark the entire heap to look for cycles because they can't exist. Um, since objects are referentially transparent, we can actually do compaction uh, without having to do extra synchronization because if we accidentally had two duplicates of an object, well, that's okay. The program would never know. Um, it's just a little extra memory for a little while until they the, the duplicate one gets collected. So we can do some really cool stuff that you couldn't do in a language like Java or C Sharp because of the need to preserve object structure or the ability to create cycles or the you know, potential for a value to change in the middle of an object. Um, I'll skip that. So I also wanna talk a little bit about uh, this, one of the big things I'm pushing on going forward, which is in the world where programming languages and AI developers meet, how does how does this look? How does this work? You know, what's going to be the future here? Um, and you know, there's some interesting things that go on because AI agents are smart, but they can go off the rails sometimes, right? Um, you know, uh, one great example I saw was someone uh, hackathon. They built a Chat GPT four powered calendar managing agent. And so they could say stuff like, oh, um, you know, can you schedule a meeting with Mark tomorrow? And it would go, great. I can generate all of the calls to Google Calendar, the JSON object. I can fill in all the time values. And, you know, it's really cool. But you look at it and what, it, what time did it pick? Well, it just picked 10 a.m., like hard coded. Now, I could be busy at 10. You could be busy at 10. Right? Maybe I'm in Europe and that's 5 a.m. for me. It, it did not have the, the knowledge that it should really, the correct way to use this API was to check availability first, right? Now, some of this is gonna be uh, addressed as, as, as these LLMs are trained on more data and get better you know, amount, sort of better at common sense reasoning for a wider and wider variety of tasks. But this is also an opportunity for us to go in and say, hey, these, these insurers and requires and other constraints, can we actually put these not just as hard constraints, like, you know, you should, but as, as soft constraints, like if something is a password, it should not be uploaded to a, you know, a public um, S3 bucket, right? Uh, P, PII should not be uploaded to a public bucket. Uh, this API, we're going to prefer versions where you check availability over a hard coded time. Maybe the hard coded time is the right answer. Maybe you want to go with that, but we're going to put a preference for some of these soft constraint satisfaction as well as hard constraint satisfaction. So this is an interesting question about how do we take these tools and this ability to do formal reasoning and use it to increase confidence that the agent isn't going totally off the rails. The other one is how do we build a programming language or how do we evolve a programming language so that it's easier for me as a human to express my intent to the AI agent and for the AI agent to express its possible solutions back to me in a way that's easier than just reading code. So let me give an example of that. So today I'm, I'm you know, a developer, I'm typing in um, VS Code, I'm using Copilot and I write this function that says, okay, uh, I wanna find the largest pair of values from two lists, X and Y, 
and it should return a tuple in in. And you know, I put synth as a keyword in, or I, I ask it to complete it. And it comes back and it says, hey, here's a solution for you. I'm going to zip the two lists together. I'm going to find the, uh, the, that, the tuple with the largest first element, and that's your answer. And it's not totally wrong, but I don't think the largest pair and the first value being the largest match. So I kind of look at this and I'm like, that's, that's wrong. I mean, you got the zip part right, you got the max part right, but the way you're selecting is totally wrong. So, you know, today I might have to look down the list at other options it presents, or I might just go write the code myself, but, you know, I'm just, I'm just using comments and textual information here um, to, to be able to express what I want. But what would be really nice is if I could put in maybe an example as part of the signature of my method. So suppose I have a list of three, two, and three, five, then the answer should be two, five. Um, and like in Bosky, we might want to go back and have an insure. So, oh, the um, output list should always contain the first element from X or the output tuple should, the first element should be from X and the second element should be from Y. And now if you go and do this, and furthermore, you allow um, the, the, the code generator to not only generate a program, but to then go check it against the examples and the contains clauses and then refilter that list and re-rank it, it, it comes up pretty easily with the correct answer you'd want here, right? So this is, this is pretty cool because it says, well, not only can I put more explicit information in the text that's going to let the large language model generate higher probability code, but I could, since that's not just a comment, it actually has semantics and meaning, I can go use it as sort of a metacognition loop where the tooling can go take the output from the LLM, run it or check it, and then re-rank it and sort of evaluate the quality of the results and make decisions based on that to sort of boost this, this confidence up. Now, again, you know, writing out one example or two examples in some cases might be nice, but uh, you know, just figuring out what these should be and typing them in can be a little frustrating. So this is kind of interesting when you start saying, well, what is a, a developer experience that isn't me just typing code into a buffer, but is me working to gather requirements and build the general structure with an AI agent filling this in as I go. So like, let's take this exact example here. Let's, you know, I've written a skeleton function that makes some calls to it with random things. And now I'm just gonna run this program. There's no implementation. But when I hit that defer method, I'm actually gonna pop up a buffer and say, hey, for this, you know, value to the call, what should the output be? And then I'll go and it'll reuse cases where the inputs matched and it'll prompt me again and again. So I can sort of interactively go and explore what the expected output of this function is. I can actually run my other code. And when I'm done, I'll actually have a list of these examples that are ready to go for, you know, that LLM GPT-4 style agent to go and generate the code for. So, I think this is a really cool example of going and rethinking, you know, what is the what is the software development experience and how does the programming language serve as a substrate for enabling all of these 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 features? So I guess going back to my conclusion here, I, I, I tie it in really well. You know, how do we really think about that programming language being the basis for everything? Humans tools, AI agents, and their communication in a more general sense than just a file of text, right? The, the key thing that is driving this again is, well, taking that programming language and trying to simplify it down and get rid of all the you know, accidental complexity that makes reasoning hard for all of these agents allows us to light up a lot of these features. And, um, you know, I think a, a good example was, you know, of, of this thinking is, um, the small model verifier, like how can we take the foundational ideas from our academic research and connect them in a practical way to the problems that industrial developers face in a way that really makes them work very well and very effectively in practice and, and brings the most value from them. Um, and then I think, you know, like there's huge implications for software development in the runtime stack and, and particularly in this, you know, um, I hate to say revolution, maybe that's too strong of a word, but this, this 
point of change with the introduction of powerful AI into software development. Like I think um, the programming language software engineering community is in a unique place here to really uh, help this cool technology, these LLMs achieve their full potential in software development. Uh, so um, I'm really excited about that. Um, a couple links uh, to two papers. Uh, one we're gonna go, I'm gonna go present in, in at Onward in Portugal here next, or this month, later this month. Um, one we did last year with some folks in the FinTech industry and then a link to some source code. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for, for their time and listening. I hope the pizza was delicious. And I sure. think I have a few minutes for questions. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, make sure that you can hear us. Can you hear me well? Uh, yeah, I can hear the microphone really well. The audience is a little quiet. Um, I'll see if I can hear. If not, uh, maybe we can walk the microphone back. Yeah. So you said something about we can guarantee the programs will halt or guarantee the amount of memory used. Yes. Does that mean you can put something into the code that guarantees that? Or does that mean that you have something weaker than a Turing machine? Um it well you so what it means is that we um okay, so uh, we don't have a decision procedure for halting if you use the full power of the language. Like you can, the language provides unrestricted recursion. So you could, you know, you could fool the checker. Um, what it means is that in we can accept many more programs than the eBPF verifier can. And if we can't do that verification, then we have to come back and say, well, I can't guarantee that, you know, the, what the bound of this, this program is. Um, but we were able to scale this up to some fairly large uh, bits of code, like several thousand lines that were previously written in uh, C. Uh, I, I want to say it's the open VPN kernel and that were sort of manually marked. Trust me, we're going to run this in kernel mode. Okay. So, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. By the way, that was Judy Goldsmith asking. <laughs> okay, good to good to hear from you again. Good to see more of your work. Well, I have, I have a question for you, okay? Um and this thing, have you already tested this uh, with some AI agents? We, this is pretty preliminary. Uh, so we did, uh, we took about 12 loops from other code we'd written. We deleted the body and then we used like chat GPT and GPT-4 with some, you know, playing around with with, with, with the prompting to generate the code. Uh, I would say a fair bit, you know, we need to experiment a bit more with what's the right way to prompt and uh, what's the right way to provide feedback. But I would say in general, I, you know, you would always get like top 10 would be much better. Top one was better in about 30 or 40% of the cases. So I think it's an interesting, it, it definitely requires a lot more experimentation to tease out what um, there's value there, but exactly the right way to expose that value. I don't think I, I have a, a good, I have clarity on just yet. I have yet another question. Hey, do you have competitors? Sorry, I lost that last bit. Uh, do you have competitors? Like, you know, there are people doing similar things to develop, uh, you know, similar uh, techniques and uh, uh, can you say, oh, yeah, my our system is. We don't know if it's the best, but uh, we have you know compared sure. with. So um, let me let me. Um, their competitor. I mean, the competitors would be. I mean, uh, I hate to use the word competitors. 
um, people, uh, people with aligned interests or similar interests. Uh, obviously, in the how do you ground the code generated by AI models? I mean, there are so many people flooding into this space. It's, I mean, it's a very hot topic. I think it's kind of interesting because so I worked with uh, like Sumit Gulwani who did this end user programming starting in 2011. And I mean, basically from 2011 to 2018, uh, you know, I think the focus of their group, and I think this is absolutely true, is we had much more primitive ways to generate code. It would be like abstract syntax tree enumeration or simple ML models to generate like these Excel formula, right? We, we, we basically use some basic NLP um, techniques and beam search and all that good stuff. And the, the big problems we had weren't necessarily generating, let's say the right code in the top 50. The challenges were the user had ambiguous input and we can find three plausible solutions for this how do we help them understand which solution is the one they actually meant, right? And building the user experience was actually a lot more important than building the, the core synthesis tool. And I think interestingly, the community who's jumped on these LLM models and how do you ground them is facing exactly the same set of challenges, right? Well, okay, just writing comments isn't enough to get my intent across for non-trivial code, right? So how do I express my intent better, like multimodal? Um, if, I, if I have two samples, you know, spitting up 30 lines of code and saying, did you want this one or this one to a developer? Developers, I mean, they can't, they can't look at 30 lines of code and make a good decision about that. So, you know, like one, one way that the, um, the synthesis community or Sumit in particular experimented with was, hey, can I find a distinguishing input and say, okay, I gave you the string, you know, Mark Marin on these two inputs. Did you want Mark or did you want Marin? And a developer, you know, an end user or even a skilled developer can look at that and quickly say that code, I wanted Marin. So that's the one I want, right? So, you know, the ability to have this communication, like what was the framework that supported this communication for intent refinement um, was actually as much of a challenge as the generation of the programs. And so in that sense, I think a lot of the community is kind of rushing to rediscover some of these techniques and then apply them in the right area. So I think, um, you know, in that sense, there are a lot of people and a lot of it's already there and it's just a matter of uh, combining it in the right way. From the program verification standpoint, I would say we can do far, far more you know, we're not doing anything novel in the actual SMT encoding. We're doing the simple, obvious thing that people tried in 2008. And it didn't work in 2008 because they got eaten by loop invariance or by mutability and frame rules, right? Well, we can do the simple, obvious thing and we can scale to, you know, order a magnitude bigger than what people do in Rust today. Um, I was at a talk uh, six months ago. And someone said, look, I can go and I can verify insertion sort modularly in Rust and it takes four seconds. Well, I took a full tic-tac-toe game that's three times, four times as large as that insertion sort and doing you know, no, no fancy anything at all encoding global analysis. I can prove arbitrary properties about that in half a second, right? So, um, you know, I think there we've got um, a, a, a real breakthrough in what's possible. And this is like this paper with VM Kai. Uh, we did this for, you know, a number of samples that were given to us by the fintech industry, right? They were like, this would be an important thing for us to be able to verify. And we can go and verify it without any, without any clever engineering. So we've got a ton of headroom there, which is really great. Any, uh, any other questions? Well, I have, I have a final question. Sure. Uh, do you consider Bobski a, a complete work or is still you know, in the process, you know, developing uh, to, to complete this work? You know? uh, still in the process of developing. Um, I think I think it, it, it was um, a very iterative process of, you know, I kind of presented it as, well, 
we had these problems, we wrote the language, the problems went away, and now we build tools on it. But um, you know, in actuality, there was a lot of, we had these problems, we built the language to get rid of those problems, we tried to do things, and we saw we were you know, in the right area, but off a little bit. And we kind of had to pull this string, and then it, it, it tapered back. So it's been a few years of refining these ideas and the way they're realized in the language. And um, now I think we're at the point where the, the language, it's really, it's nice to program in, writing parts of the compiler in that programming language. You know, people can actually start writing, you know, interesting applications in the language. And now it's really a matter of building out that tooling and, and, and doing some of the interesting research explorations um, uh, using this language as a basis. So I'm, mm. You know, I think it's an exciting point to actually be, you know, put in put in a lot of capital to build the the base to get the the, the, the you know the key foundation bits in place, and now it's a, a nice time to cash in on that uh, with and make some progress on the research side. All right, thank you very very much. Great. Well, thank you everybody. Have a have a nice rest of the day. <laughs>